Good morning. I want to thank you for joining us today as um, we introduce you to a little known but very important feature of WordPress um, called multi-site. And um, the format of this presentation today um, will be a case study on a project that's near and dear to my heart. Um, the company that I work for, The Motley Fool, currently runs all its global sites using the WordPress platform. And um, in particular, those sites are powered by multi-site. So the title of today's presentation will be Powering a Global Membership E-Commerce Platform with Multi-Site or Why Multi-Site is Not Dead. Uh, you may be wondering about the title of this presentation. Um, there was a recent discussion, maybe a few months back, um, by a few individuals over the usefulness and uh, continued longevity of the feature. Um, some argued that it should probably be deprecated. Um, it was bloated, confusing, and poorly supported. Um, while others were arguing that there are so many different use cases that we could apply the multi-site feature to that it's probably around to stay for the long term. Um, some of those numerous benefits I will be diving into throughout the course of this presentation today. And, you know, obviously, if you look at this image, I am the cat in this argument. You know, there really isn't anything that you could say to me that would um, shift my perspective or change my opinion on the usefulness and viability of multi-site as a feature in WordPress. So I think the best way to illustrate my viewpoint is through a case study, as I mentioned before at the beginning of the presentation. Um, but before we do that, let's get a little bit about myself. So, um, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, my name is Ryan. Um, I once tried to build a personal blog with a Flash front end powered by WordPress. Um, I think the kids call that headless nowadays, but before then, before the REST API was available, um, I was kind of fiddling around with WordPress trying to get it to work that way. And 15 years later, I'm still working in the WordPress community and developing websites using this platform. A little bit about where I'm from. If you haven't picked up the accent, I am from Jamaica, probably one of the most recognizable flags on the planet. Here are a couple of things that I like. I'm a huge cat person. I adore my two cats. We've got Stella at the top and Zeus down below. I'm also a sneakerhead, well, probably more of a recovering sneaker addict. Um, I, I really spend too much money on these things. And uh, yeah, I also am into fast cars. Um, the picture that you see here is an unreliable four banger called a Subaru WRX, um, one of my favorite vehicles. Let's keep it moving. Um, this is basically who I do all of this for. This is the moment where you all go, ah. Um, and yeah, let's get back into it. Um, obviously, as I said before, um, I think you may recognize that I'm a huge Chelsea fan. I'm super into soccer. Don't do, it's not fine. Um, I also started my web development journey while studying in Moscow. Um, that was a really cool place to kind of pick up some of the, the early habits that have endured through my career. And we can get right back into the presentation. So here's the situation. The Motley Fool, the company that I work for, was already a well-established presence in the United States, helping our members achieve their financial goals. Um, but we really wanted to try and fulfill our mission statement of making the world, and not just the United States, smarter, happier, and richer. The tech stack that we had, however, for the fool.com was uh, a little bit challenging to work with. And in order for us to expand our footprint globally, um, we had to try and devise a different solution for uh, meeting the needs of our stakeholders and getting the message out there without being kind of hindered or held back by the tech stack that we currently had in place for the fool.com. So a little backstory about the fool. Um, the fool is 30 years old. It was founded in 1993 by the brothers Gardner. Um, its headquarters are based not too far from here in Alexandria. 
and the full features and provides free and premium expert investment head gu guidance via its website and its newsletter subscriptions as well. Um, now, at the time, there were other facets of the Fool's operations, including a stock rating system, um, market beating stock and fund recommendations. And more recently, we launched a wealth and asset management arm. That's the regulated side of our business. So as I mentioned, our tech stop was a little difficult and challenging to extend. It was built on .NET. And if anybody's familiar with .NET, then you would understand and appreciate that most software that runs on that operating system is gonna be proprietary. The software at the time did feature a front and back end commerce system with an authentication layer for access to premium content. And these were all things that we had to take into consideration when developing our own alternative um, that we were going to eventually use for branching out into the global space. So how did we get to WordPress? Well, maybe around 10 or so years ago, leadership was looking for new markets to extend our business into. And we identified Australia as a desirable market for expanding the Fool's global footprint. Ideally, we'd want to be able to go fast and break stuff, right? Now, this is a common you know, development paradigm, especially in the startup ecosystem where you're trying to get an uh, idea or a project off the ground very quickly and get it into a functional state um, with the least possible resistance. And I think that WordPress is an ideal candidate um, for anybody who's looking to quickly and effectively develop software to meet a functionality requirement set in a very short period of time. Um, as I said before, our .NET stack was pretty hard to work with. The code base was monolithic. And by monolithic, I mean the applications, components, the front end, the back end, um, commerce, authentication, et cetera, were all located in the same place, um, which made it kind of difficult to extend. It also made deployments pretty hard and time consuming and also risky. And um, so that inability to scale our existing stack kind of led us down this pathway where we eventually ended up with WordPress. Um, at the time, there was no way to customize an alternative experience for a new segment, a new market, without major disruption to existing processes and infrastructure. And entering additional markets later on would probably only increase the complexity. So there really wasn't any way to effectively iterate. So the question that arose out of this is how do we, as a team, quickly, reliably, and effectively reach our target audience and satisfy our internal stakeholders? We needed to be able to replicate the core functionality of our existing tech stack, but make it global and infinitely extensible. So we needed to do things like manage content, gate access, and process con transactions via e-commerce. So during one of our regularly scheduled hackathons um, in the company in that time, like I said, it was around 10 years ago, um, a team of developers kind of put their heads together and um, came up with the idea that we should use WordPress with multi-site. Um, before I move forward, I want to just emphasize that this isn't like an official logo for multi-site. It's just something I kind of came up with to kind of add a little razzle-dazzle to the presentation. Um, don't tell Matt. Okay. Um, so the answer for us at the time was WordPress multi-site. But why does it check all the boxes? Well, as I mentioned before, we wanted to go fast and break stuff. And um, I think that rapid prototyping is one of those software um, paradigms that's easily facilitated by WordPress. Um, you know, something that we can move a proof of concept to a highly functional working application in a short period of time. Um, the ability for us to iterate, you know, launch multiple products quickly with the same basic functionality, but different content and customizable enhancements to each different service that we provide so that you could justify the price point for each one of these tiers that we're going to be offering to our members. And of course, WordPress had a very familiar admin experience that most of us are pretty, you know, comfortable with working. 
and um, you know to allow non-technical personnel to be able to log in and create and add content to the websites that was also an equally important um, factor that we had to consider when coming up with a software solution so what is multi-site anyway well, according to WordPress, multi-site is a feature of WordPress 3.0 and later versions that allows multiple virtual sites to share a single WordPress installation. So what does that look like? Typically, if you wanted to host it, if you wanted to host two or three different WordPress sites, you would have to create two or three different hosting environments within which those sites would live. But multi-site allows you to host multiple sites, whether three, a dozen, a hundred, all in the same hosting environment with the same database and the same code base. Multi-site began as a fork of WordPress, actually, um, called WordPress Multi-User, or WordPress Mu for short. Um, in fact, um, you may have heard in some other presentations um, folks mentioning the MU plugins folder. Um, the MU in MU plugins used to stand for multi-user, but in recent time, the, the, the meaning, I guess, has been changed to signify must use instead of multi-user. But MU plugins was one of the artifacts of that fork that I mentioned earlier where WordPress became WordPress multi-user. Eventually, this fork was merged back into core, um, starting with version 3.0 in 2010. And uh, if you haven't heard of multi-site before, multi-site is currently used to power one of the largest WordPress sites in the world, WordPress.com. The reason you may not have heard about multi-site before or know that it even exists is because the only way uh, you can actually enable a multi-site installation is from the command line install or from adjusting and making changes to the WP config file on your hosting environment. It really isn't a part of the famous five minute install that we've all grown accustomed to. And as such, not many people know that this feature of WordPress exists. So how does it all work and what makes it a perfect solution for all specific needs at The Motley Fool? We're going to take another break and we're going to get into the demo portion of our presentation today, where I'll be demonstrating how we can first convert an existing single site installation to multi-site and then I'll be walking you through some of the features of multi-site as well. So in order for us to get this demonstration started, I'm going to be spinning up a local environment that's going to be hosting a vanilla clean installation of a WordPress single site um, instance. So to get that started, I'm going to be opening up my IDE. I'm going to make sure that you can all see what I'm doing here. Then I'm going to navigate to the folder where my site actually exists. I think I saved it in this folder here. There we go. And then from here, you see I have two different sites set up. So we're going to go into the one that doesn't have multi-site installed. And we're going to start it up. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, the development environment that I'm using here. Um, I'm using Lando, which is basically an abstraction of Docker. Um, so we have our site running in a Docker container on my local environment, and that allows us to quickly in and easily preview um, what a single site installation looks like. So with us, a few keystrokes are all set. We're going to go back to our window, 
and open up the page and see what we got. So everybody is already familiar with the admin experience on a single site install. Um, you have an admin menu on the left hand side that allows you to essentially peruse all the different features that are available in a WordPress installation. Um, so you've got posts and pages, etc. Um, and so this is what a typical single site install looks like. But let's see now what happens if we try to convert this single site to a multi-site instance. So in order for us to do that, as I mentioned before, there are a couple of ways that we can convert a single site instance to a multi-site instance. And the recommended way is by editing the WP config file and adding a few lines of code there to instruct WordPress to initiate the multi-site installation. And what it does then is that it adds a few additional user table, well, it adds a few additional tables to the database and makes a few configuration settings to enable the multi-site feature. But we're not going to be actually editing any files today. We're going to actually just try and do everything using the command line. So the WordPress CLI or command line interface does have a command for converting a single site installation to a multi-site. So we're just going to look for that. So there are a couple of commands that are available. You can either use the multi-site install or the one that we're going to be interested in would be the multi-site convert because we already have a single site instance that we want to convert. So let's go ahead and copy this command and we're going to run it in our terminal. And then the parameters that we have to pass to it, we need to pass the title of our new network. So let's go ahead and pass that as well. I'm just going to call it my network. And we'll hit enter and see what happens. <laughs> right, so we've got the success message saying that the network has installed. Um, it's going to ask us as well to add some entries to our HD access file. Um, if we're using Apache, if we're using Nginx, um, there will be some additional configuration settings that you'll also have to create. Um, but we've already done that and we have a version of the site that has been set up with all the bells and whistles. So let's go ahead and launch that. So we're going to go to our completed site that has everything already set up. Let's open that URL. And here we are logged in in our new site. So you see there are a couple of differences here between the menu structure for the single site installation and the menu structure for a multi-site installation. So you see that we have this My Sites menu item that has now appeared um, because we converted our single site installation to multi-site. And if you go to that menu item and click on Network Admin, you'll see that there are a few new items that are here that were not present before in our old environment. So as you can see, there are multiple sites that you can set up. Um, we can manage themes and plugins that are globally available. Um, you know, and I'm going to be walking you through how we can set up different sites using multi-site that point to either a subdirectory 
or folder or a subdomain of your existing site or they can also point to an entirely new site if you wanted to. So if you needed to add a new site to a multi-site install, you'd simply go to the Sites tab, you click the Add New button, you provide the URL that you want this new site to point to. So I'll just call this Demo Site. And you can specify the title for it as well. Um, provide a email address that will serve as the admin user for this site. And just like that, you have a new site that's set up. And so the cool thing about this is that each site is basically a separate entity. You can configure and customize each site based on your particular needs. So if you want it to look different from the other sites, you can play around with the theme, change the theme entirely. If you want to have functionality that's specific to this site, you can also go ahead and do that. So I'm going to launch this new site in a window just to see what that looks like. Then I'm going to go to visit. And so if I want this site to look differently from the main site, which is here, I can simply go in and change the theme. So instead of having the 2023 theme activated, I can actually activate the 2022 theme and immediately change the look and feel of the site. So if I go back to the front page of the demo set that I just created, you can now see that the entire look and feel has changed, but the main site continues to look like this. So that's one of the really cool features about multi-site. You can have everything operating in the same code base on the same platform with the same database, but you can configure and customize each site to suit your own needs. So at this point, I'm gonna get back into the presentation and kind of walk you through how we at The Fool use multi-site for providing products and services to our members. There we go. So the Motley Fool basically offers services based on areas of interest. So let's say, for example, you as an investor are interested in dividend stocks or you're interested in up and coming technology stocks or you're interested in cryptocurrency. We offer a service that coincides with any one of those areas of interest that you're particularly looking for. And so each, it's, each service is distinct from each other. And here we have an example of two, of two services that we currently offer on the fool.com. Um, so let's say, for example, you're interested in recommendations on digital assets like cryptocurrencies, then you would subscribe to the Digital Explorers service. And if you're more interested in learning about how you can invest in the real estate market, we also have a service that caters to that, and um, that service is Real Estate Winners. And so each one of these services would be hosted on a different site within our multi-site network. And so that allows us to basically curate the content based on the specific needs of each particular service. So you wouldn't see any cross content that's not necessarily relevant to the service that you're interested in. Um, it also allows our contributors to go in and post content that's specific to that service without stepping on anybody else's toes or any teams that are focused on other services that the fool.com offers. As you've seen, launching a new site only takes a few clicks, which means launching a new product and service also only takes a few clicks inside the WordPress administration area. So like I said before, all within the same admin, contributors can navigate their way around the site. Each service can exist as a subfolder, a subdomain, or even an entirely different domain. And if we wanted to go into a new market, so let's say tomorrow, instead of Australia, we wanted to try Canada. We could do that as well using the exact same setup that you see here.
So how do our members gain access to the content that we provide? So we have a thing called entitlements that allows us to control access to purchased content and content that our users have subscribed to, whether by a newsletter or in the website. So when you subscribe to a service, we store that information in the form of an entitlement that allows us to check with our mainframe servers whether or not you can access content from a particular service. So as I displayed before, you have our services represented as individual sites within the network. To control access to those individual sites, we communicate with our main servers at thefool.com to see if this particular member who has this unique ID and email address actually has access to view the content that they're trying to view. So what does that look like? A user logs in to one of our service sites. We communicate with our servers to check to see if this user has access to the site that they're trying to view. The server responds with a list of all the entitlements that this particular user may have. And then based on that list, we double check against the name of the site that the user is trying to access. And if that name appears in this list, then they're let in. If that name is not in that list, then we deny access and we prompt them to purchase it. Um, in order for us to do that, we needed to hook into WordPress to kind of short circuit the login process. And this is one of the cool benefits of using WordPress as a solution here because um, it's typically described as an event-driven platform, so the architecture is event-driven. So at each step of an operation, there's an opportunity to basically interject and say, hey, this just happened, what would you like us to do? Before moving on to the next step in the sequence of um, steps that need to happen for a particular operation to execute. So for example, when somebody is trying to log into a WordPress site, there are multiple steps along the way that need to happen. And each one of those steps is preceded by what we call a hook or a filter or an action, depending on what you want to come out of that particular event. And we basically use these events to make and initiate communication with our servers, make sure that they have the access that they need. And if the person has that access, then we allow the operation to continue. Or if they don't have access, then we using that hook will basically end the login procedure and we will redirect them to a page where somebody can actually purchase the service that they are trying to access. And this code snippet that you see here is simply an example of what that would look like typically. So how does multi-site help us here? So multi-site essentially has a single user table for all the services and all the sites that we provide, which means that we can check against the single user table to ensure that the user has the capabilities to access a particular site that's listed in that user's profile. So continuing with this notion as of a service as a site, um, we needed to be able to distinguish between different services, free and premium experiences. Um, so the free or main site probably wouldn't have the same feature set that a premium site would have. For example, we have investor tools like scorecards that are available on premium sites that are not available on the main site, as well as maybe widgets with real-time stock quotes, etc. cetera. Um, and when I mention a scorecard, scorecards are essentially um, a way to track a portfolio of companies. So you could have a list of maybe 10 or so companies inside a portfolio. Um, that either the Motley Fool has purchased and owns shares in, or it could be an imaginary or notional scorecard where we just pretend that we bought these stocks and then we can track the performance of this portfolio um, once you become a member of the service. Um, so in order for us to be able to distinguish between free and premium <coughs> offerings, um, we can do that with the same process that I demonstrated before where you can switch the themes between different sites. You can install plugins that are available to a specific site or it's available to the entire network. And in doing so, we can customize and kind of basically cater the user experience based on what they've subscribed for and whether it's a paid subscription or if it's free. 
So you all remember that hackathon that I had mentioned before? Um, essentially, once the developers who had teamed up to put together a WordPress installation that basically featured um, some of those functionality requirements that I had mentioned before, um, you know, we had an email capture form on our first iteration of this project. Um, we put up a few company pages and uh, leadership responded in, on, well, I guess in the only way that it could. Obviously, they weren't actually aware that WordPress could do all the things that we said they could. And then when we put the prototype out, they were very impressed. And so a few months later, Full Australia was launched on the WordPress platform using, using multi-site. And we've stuck with multi-site ever since. So this brings us to the part of the presentation where we discuss how all of these disparate services and sites all come together. We needed to find a way to tie all the content together using multi-site, and there really wasn't a native way for us to do that. So how do we do it? Everything comes together with this concept called a tickle. And so a tickle in financial terms is an entity identified by a symbol. Right? And a symbol can be simply an exchange and then the name of the company, usually abbreviated. So an example of a symbol would be NYSE Shop. And this represents Shopify, which is a publicly traded company. And so that company stock is called an instrument. And instruments, like I said before, can be company stocks. They can also be mutual funds. Um, an instrument can also be crypto. And we use these tickers to basically categorize content on each one of our services and sites. So companies can have multiple tickers as well, right? So Shopify, for example, also trades on the Canadian stock market. So on the Canadian stock market, Shopify would have a symbol like TSX shop instead of NYSC shop. And so this format allows us and this infrastructure allows us to specify different symbols for the same company and tag content with the relevant symbols whenever that content is being created on each of the different network sites that we have available. So as you can imagine, if we were to use a custom taxonomy to create this new category that we use to associate content with companies, um, because of the way multi-site is set up, each site has its own table for all the terms that are associated with that taxonomy. All right, so let's get a little bit more into what a custom taxonomy is. Taxonomies are simply just the method of classifying content and data in WordPress, a simple way to relate content to each other. And if you are not familiar with the word taxonomy, WordPress comes with two default taxonomies categories and tags. Um, so we decided to use this many to one relationship to basically create connections between different articles that we may post and the companies that they are related to. Um, but one drawback to using this model um, in the context of a multi-site installation is that, like I said before, each multi-site or each site within a multi-site network has its own taxonomy table. So we'd end up duplicating content across dozens of different sites. So we'd have to create a term for Shopify on the main site, and then we'd have to log in to one of our premium sites and create that term again so that we could associate content with that. And doing this multiple times for like 10, 12, 50 sites becomes very tedious. It also creates a lot of bloat. So if you can see in this example, um, these are examples of the table structure of the sites, and in particular, the taxonomy tables that are used in multi-site. And so if we continue to replicate terms across multi-sites, you'll find that um, the number of rows that are actually used in the database for providing information, all the same information, the exact same information across multiple sites exponentially grows. And that isn't really desirable. So how do we actually overcome this obstacle 
to allow us to start classifying and associating content with the companies that they were associated with. Um, we came up with this thing called a global ticker taxonomy. And so what this global ticker taxonomy does, it allows us to create cross-site relationships between disparate pieces of content. Um, once upon a time, this is actually possible with multi-site natively, um, but it also included a lot, of, a lot of replication that we were trying to avoid. So how does this work? Um, if you are aware, most queries that take place in WordPress are simply SQL statements that have different table references that are used to create the results that you see in these queries. So what we decided to do was instead of using the default table references in a multi-site context, we wanted to replace those table references with the main site tables instead. So the queries that we performed on premium sites were adjusted via hooks, once again, to point to the main site tables instead of the default tables that were associated with that particular site. And so in doing that, we were able to prevent any sort of duplication of content and have all of our company tickers, which at this point I think is around 30 or 40,000 terms, be in one table instead of multiple tables. We also wanted to ensure that the relationships that were established between pieces of content and terms were preserved. We didn't want to have all those relationships stored in one table. That wouldn't really make a lot of sense. So the table references that we update are only those that provide information about the term itself, but not the relationships. So as I said before, the end result is that all term table lookups use the main site for their term tables, while each site's term relationships are preserved. These are where objects are associated with their terms. All those relationships are preserved on a site-by-site -site basis. So how did we actually get that to work? Um, once again, we use WordPress's hook system um, to basically short circuit the, um, the query that we initiated and instruct WordPress to use the main site table instead of the table that was by default associated with the network site that we were trying to get information from. So what does that look like in that show? Um, let's go again to our demo site and I can provide you with an example of what that looks like and the code that we had actually used to enable this feature. So going back to our demo site, we've created a few examples. Um, we've already created a ticker taxonomy and if you go into the post section of the site, you can see that now, in addition to categories and tags, we have a new tickers taxonomy that allows contributors to go in and tag content with specific companies. So if you go inside here, you'll see that we've added one company. So we added Shopify as a term inside the tickers taxonomy. And if you go to articles or posts, we've created a new article that is about the company Shopify. And if you go to the edit context, you'll see that we have associated this article with the term that we had created in the Tickers taxonomy called Shopify. That should load up in a second. So you see here that under Tickers, we have the Shopify term associated with this article. And what that allows us to do is associate content with the Shopify term by using that same box that I just demonstrated. So let's go back to the dashboard and we will go back to tickers. And if we view this term, you can see that that article that I created actually shows up as one of the articles that is associated with this particular company. 
And with the adjustments that we had made in code, this is now actually possible on the other subsites as well. So let's navigate to one of our sites that we had created. Let's go to Stock Advisor, for example. As you can see, Stock Advisor has an entirely different look and feel from the main site. And if we go to the dashboard for Stock Advisor and then navigate to the tickers, you see that we also have a term here. This term is not new, it is the exact same term that's on the main site. And if you click on the view button here, you see that we also have a premium story about Shopify here, whereas on the free or main site, it's an entirely different article. So what we allow us, what this allows us to do is create like unique relationships between content and their terms without having to replicate the information about that term in a different site. So I'm going to show you the code that allows us to do that. So let's go back to our command line and we're going to navigate to the plugin that was created for accomplishing this. So here's our demo plugin, and then I'm just going to launch this in our IDE so you can see what we did here. So here is the code for the plugin that we created specifically for the purpose of creating our global ticker taxonomy. And you can see here, we register the taxonomy first. And then we use a few filters and actions to ensure that whenever terms are being looked up for this specific taxonomy, that it uses the tables that are associated with the main site and not with the premium site. So we have a few functions set up here that basically changes the table references for ticker pages, for the admin page, um, there are a few other hooks there that we use to ensure that when you're using the picker, for example, in the premium site context, that the terms from the main site show up. And so with only a few lines of code, we were able to take what is a non-native feature, which is the ability to share taxonomies across multiple sites and make it so that our contributors can assign terms to content across multiple sites that are the same as the ones on the main side. So this really makes it infinitely easier for us to classify content and to collate content and to bring all of that content together. So now that that, that that demonstration is concluded, let's get back to the presentation and we can discuss what next steps would look like for us as a team at The Motley Fool, as well as what we're hoping to see happen with multi-site moving forward. So what does the future look like? Um, as you've seen, we've demonstrated how multi-site can be useful in a variety of scenarios. Um, a few typical scenarios where multi-site is useful include the education sector, healthcare, and obviously in our, UK, in our use case in any sort of membership platform where you might be considering using some alternative like um, there are some popular plugins out there like MemberPress that utilize categories and taxonomies and, and user roles to basically segregate or segment content. Um, we decided to go the more native route of just using multi-site to accomplish that. Um, next up for the global team is to try and bring all of this content together in a premium hub experience. So we want to try and aggregate the content with a full text search index like Elasticsearch or Solar. And as far as what we want to see for multi-site moving forward, um, I think the first thing is, you know, rather than us 
creating this additional code that allows us to share taxonomy terms across different sites natively, it should happen out of the box. Um, we also want to ensure that, you know, moving forward, uh, multi-site isn't really treated like, you know, some distant stepchild of WordPress, and it should be made available by default um, in any WordPress installation, um, perhaps as a toggle, you know, in the five-minute install where you're specifying, like, the connection settings for the database, etc. You could just have another checkbox here that says, do you want this to be a single-site installation or a multi-site installation? And of course, you know, because multi-site powers one of the biggest WordPress sites in the world, we can continue to extend the feature moving forward with whatever learnings um, that we get from operating WordPress.com. And that pretty much brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, if not, I don't want to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to, you know, present on multi-site, which is a topic in WordPress that's near and dear to my heart, as I mentioned. Um, I want to thank my teammates, you know, who, you know, I'm just really privileged to work with and who are all much smarter than I am and have introduced me to a lot of concepts that um, I've utilized in establishing, you know, the global taxonomy, for example, that I mentioned before and um, have kind of supported me on my journey in multi-site and in WordPress as well. And so, yeah, that's it. Thanks again. I have a few questions. Go ahead. Right. So. I saw your example earlier with the the um the multi site, but um you went to the site tab specifically. Uh yeah, so there's like a there's a tab inside the uh, menu section where it says site. And I saw that's where you um you kind of if I remember correctly, you I think you added like content, but I'm not sure what kind of content it was. Or actually, I think that's where you were um, adding like the sub site. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So my question is, once you have multiple uh, sites or sub sites inside your multi site, right? Um, how do you divvy the 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 workload? Or like, if you have a team member of five developers, how do you? Um, I I think you were talking a little bit about it, like through the PHP, but yeah. Please explain how you would. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So essentially how we manage um, users across different sites, as I mentioned before, even though we have multiple sites, it's still one user table. So in order for us to create users on different sites, um, you can actually go to the dashboard for each site and you can create a user. So let's go ahead and do that now. So this new set that we had created, demo site, we can go to the dashboard for that site and then we can go to users. And as you can see, I'm the only user there. But we can add a new user. And this is a developer or this is for? This would be like for our developer, right? So we can add a new user called developer. Okay. Right, and we can make their role administrator. Oh, sorry, I need to add a new user, not an existing one, sorry. So we'd go here. And we just provide an email address. And we change the role to administrator. Okay. And we don't need to send a confirmation email. And so this developer would only have access to this site. Okay. Oh, sorry, I used. I understand though, um, in, and this is, in the, this is in the site section? Yeah, so this is in the site section. So you use the site section to get to the individual site. So this menu item up here, yeah. um, if you go to network admin and you click on that, this demonstrates a new interface that allows you to interact with all the different sites that are available inside your network. So you can go to all sites and you see each one of the sites that we've already configured. And so if you want to configure a site individually, you can always just hover over it and click on the dashboard and that will get you to the UI that has like all the information about users and pages, et cetera. Okay. Uh, my next question that I had had to do with uh, the ticker section. Um, my understanding is for me, like I saw that you, you used it to, for tags, like um, maybe not a tag, but like let's say when you're my understanding is, let's say I'm I'm reading like the words, like you know the blue highlight where you click the link and then it highlights to like the 
you know, yeah. would that be like a good example for like how you would use the ticker? Exactly. So if you go to a typical article, you'll usually see like a list of tags or categories that are associated with it, right? Oh. So um, let's go to our main site. And then when you visit an article, usually you'd see like something like tags listed here. Right? Okay. Um, so you can actually edit this to include um, terms from any taxonomy, not just the tax taxonomy. Um, there might actually be um, a block that we can insert that shows all the terms that are associated with, with, with this particular article. Let's see if it's available. Okay. So this is using um, the site editor, which is part of um, the, the latest themes that are available at WordPress 6.3. And so you see here that we can edit each of the components that are used in an article. So we have the title, for example. Let's see if we can insert something underneath the title that shows us what categories or tags are associated with it. All right, so we're gonna go in to this block and we're gonna add a new block after it. And then let's go ahead and search for So right now we have terms and categories. What else do we have? All right, let's go to the block settings. All right, so if you were to add any new categories to this um, page, then they would show up underneath here. So let's go ahead and add a category. Um, so we're gonna go back to the dashboard and close that out. And we're gonna edit this article with some new categories. Right, so to enable that block for a custom taxonomy, it would require a little bit more code, but I think I should be able to demonstrate the point I'm making um, just using the categories instead. So if we add a test category and hit update and view the post, you can see now that you have a list coming up here. Right? So that's basically how it would work, except in order for us, for us to enable this for custom taxonomies, um, there would be a little bit additional code that we'd have to write to accomplish that. Okay. Not to hold you up too, too long. No, uh, go ahead, man. Call to actions. So my understanding for call to actions, like, at least through, like, when it comes to... JavaScript, you kind of like, you insert, you know, the link or whatever it is that you want to be in, in the section and then it takes you to the, to the next like site. Or like if you want a pop-up to pop up when you hover over something, you have to like punch that in. How do you gain control of the website in that aspect? Because in my head, you know, and again, I'm, I'm familiarizing myself with WordPress, but in my head, you know, when you're coding, you have every single ability to like hold the, the website from a parameter. Sure. I'm not understanding how you would create a call to action. Is it, are you relying on the plugin that you would need at that time? Or like, how would you really do you understand? I don't know. So there are a bunch of ways that you can actually approach this. Um, it doesn't really matter whether you're using multi-site or single site. This is more a question about um, the different ways that are currently out there for um, inserting content and additional interactive functionality into our existing page, right? So what content management systems allow us to do is um, not have to worry or focus on, you know, the, the markup that's required for creating this functionality and focus more on creating a UI that allows, you know, non-technical users to accomplish what otherwise would require like developer inter intervention to achieve. So creating something as simple as a pop-up um, in modern WordPress development would be us creating a block that we can use to then insert um, 
you know that content into a article or a page etc so let's go ahead and try and edit this post um, just to give an example of what that would look like I appreciate it so in here we have the ability to create multiple types of elements um, using the block editor right so um, we have all of these blocks to choose from as you can see here from the left so I guess in order for us to do something like launch a pop-up the first thing that we would do is maybe create a button and then you would just basically provide the label for the button and then once you actually create that button you can provide the link that it goes to Right, and so what the content management system and in particular the block editor allows us to do is not have to focus on what the HTML needs to look like in order to accomplish this. We just use the UI and all the different components that are available in the UI to do that. So once we hit update and we go back to the post, you see that the button is now there and you click on it and it will take it to Google or wherever else you want to go. Uh, my last question. My last question, would you say that um, the premium WordPress uh, account, would, would that be necessary for someone that is trying to begin? Or would you say practice with? with no, one, of the, one of the great things about being in the WordPress community is that it's most, if not all, resources that are needed in order to get you ramped up and working as a developer within WordPress are free. Um, anyone will tell you that we spend most of our days in WordPress forums. Um, in GitHub repositories, in issue queues, um, in Stack Overflow, there's just a wide, diverse amount of information that's available about WordPress and developing within WordPress, freely available on the internet for you to use to kind of get yourself familiarized with how things work. Okay. I appreciate you. Thank you so no, much. Man, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending.